So uh, again, thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is actually my second time at GCAP. I was very lucky to have been asked to come here as part of the International Speakers Program last year um, through Film Victoria. And I gotta say, when you give talks, sometimes you, you find yourself thinking, why have I done this to myself? There's this kind of harrowing to give talks sometimes, but um, I've never had more fun giving a talk than I did at GCAP, so I was very excited to come back this year, so thank you so much for having me. Um, so before we dive in, I want to take a moment to frame the conversation around what I mean when I'm talking about the unmanageable project, AKA the shitty project. <laughs> so these projects can take on a lot of shapes and forms and sizes, so sometimes you're talking about an entire game, and sometimes you're talking about a piece of a game, like a critical set of features that you have to get done in superhuman time, or maybe you've got a demo that you need to get done for a conference, like I would imagine some of you who've been demoing this week have spent at least a little time up Chick Creek, if you're anything like my team. But um, as a general rule, I do find that these types of projects tend to meet three criteria. And that's that they're high risk with a clear opportunity for failure. They're usually heavily resource constrained. And in the context of this conversation, the resource I'm really talking about is time. And last but not least, there are clear consequences for failure. So something bad's gonna happen if you can't deliver. It could be something like, oh, well, I don't get that promotion I was hoping to get, or my team has run out of money because we couldn't finish in the time that we'd specified. So unfortunately, the reality of the games industry <laughs> is that if you spend any amount of time working in games, you will find yourself on a crazy, shitty project with an insane deadline, and you're gonna have to find a way to make it work. It, you know, it just kind of goes with the territory, especially these days when we're forced to do more with less. It seems like all of us, whether you're a big company or a small company, that that's our reality. But I don't necessarily think that it has to be a terrible, hard thing. So I spent a lot of time working on these kinds of projects, and uh, I kind of like them because it's a bit like dumping a bunch of puzzle pieces out on a table and kind of going, I don't see how these will logically fit together but I know that there is some way that they can. So if you look at it in the right frame of mind, it can be pretty fun. So I should probably take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Amy Dallas. I am a co-founder of Clutch Play Games out of Portland, Oregon. I'm on the board of directors of the Oregon Games Organization, which is a little bit like Film Victoria, Creative Victoria um, for Oregon. And uh, this year I was on the advisory committee of the Austin Games Conference, which is the closest thing I've found in the US to, to uh, GCAP. So if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. So Clutch Play has been around for about six years, but my team and I have worked together for many years before that. We actually started out as part of a larger studio system. And um, we're all AAA vets from the Bay Area. And we moved to Portland in search of a better way of life cheaper housing, shorter commute times, better booze and coffee and the things that make life worth living, right? So, um, because we all have that AAA background and we, we do develop our own games, but we actually started doing some consulting a couple years ago. So because we have that AAA background, um, we tend to take on projects where clients have a pretty dire technical need that they need to get done extremely quickly. So we live in this constant state of being up shit creek quite often. So that's actually kind of a comfort zone for us. And that's actually probably a good thing um, because I actually really like these kinds of projects. And um, if you'd asked me when I was younger, hey, do you think you're gonna like taking on a bunch of really shitty hard projects and making them work? I would have been like, hell no, who would wanna do that? That sounds terrible. But um, for me, I kind of got excited about taking on really difficult projects back when I worked on Sims 2 many years ago for Maxis. And it was one of those situations where I came in in the middle of the project and um, I, you know, I didn't know anything. And I'm sitting around the production table and they say, okay, who wants to take the animation pipeline? And everybody's kind of looking down, looking in their laps. And I'm like, okay, I'll take it. And everybody's like, oh, thank God. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I just sign up for? And um, as it turned out, the animation pipeline was many, many man months behind the rest of the project. 
And several people had come in before me and tried very sensible things that just did not work. And they ran screaming from the project, and so suddenly it's on me to figure out how to do it. And I'll talk about how we did it a little later, but um, long story short, we went from being the most behind to finishing about a week, week and a half early without a lot of overtime, which on that project was insane because everybody was doing overtime and a lot of it. So that really taught me what was possible and it really kind of made me realize that there's something kind of fun about making something that seems undoable, doable. However, it really burnt me out. So I ended up thinking, you know, I don't think I want to be in games anymore. I think I'm going to go do something else. And has anybody ever tried to leave games in here? Any hands? Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about. When you try to leave games, you kind of quickly find that the games industry perverts your brain in, in kind of a very specific way, such that when you try to leave games, you realize that everything else is really fucking boring, to be honest with you. It's really boring. And so I lived in Portland. I was working on kind of tech projects and working in the nine to five thing. And I'm like, wow, this is really boring. There aren't enough difficult problems to solve. And I've come to think of this as the Hurt Locker effect. I don't know, have you guys seen the Hurt Locker? So the guy is a bomb diffuser and he's used to keeping things from blowing up. And suddenly he has this existential crisis in the middle of a cereal aisle because the biggest problem he's trying to solve is there's too much cereal to buy and I have, I have to buy one. And so the way that I addressed that was to take on every project and every place I worked that, was, that seemed impossible. And in fact, the last job I had before I uh, went back into games was for a company where every client I had basically came to us with a project that was in a mess and they said, if you can't fix this, I'll be fired. So some super fun client interactions during that job. <laughs> so having run a lot of those projects and also doing some of those projects for Clutch Play, I've come to learn that managing these kind of projects involves a few key elements. It's, it's a mindset. And that's fear management, expectation management, and chaos management. So I want to start off by talking about fear. I was really excited to learn that somebody did an entire talk on fear yesterday at this conference, which unfortunately I missed. Um, because I don't think as an industry we talk about it enough. We're starting to talk about things like imposter syndrome and self-doubt, but fear is a really real driver for a lot of people. And it's my belief, having had to take over a lot of really crazy projects, that developing a healthy relationship with fear is, is critical to your success. Because fear can be really useful, and also it, it just kind of goes with the territory. Where there's a clear opportunity for failure, there's fear of failure. And in fact, uh, when I first put this slide deck together for GDC this year, um, <clears throat> I found this Gallup poll a few years ago with the top 10 human fears. As you can see, fear of failure is on there right under death. And uh, I actually think, you know, as I was thinking as I was putting this deck together for this conference that here in Australia, it feels like death and spiders should share a line item because <laughs> like every other spider will either kill you or scare you to death. So it's kind of a twofer there. Also, I think it's funny that fear of public speaking is number two and death is six. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, priorities, everybody. So, you know, fear of failure, it's a real thing for a lot of people. So I think it's interesting that we don't as an industry talk about it more. So why is it we don't talk about it? Well, for one thing, I think a lot of people fear that it's going to be perceived as weakness. This is a very much a survival of the fittest industry. It's highly competitive. And admitting any kind of weakness does not, to a lot of people, seem like a, a sound life choice. Also, people tend to be concerned that somehow it's going to be disqualifying. Like, somehow, if I admit to any kind of weakness, that people will think I'm unfit for the job. And last but not least, I think a lot of people don't talk about fear because they end up comparing themselves to others who seem very confident and they think, oh, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. In fact, I had this discussion with, with a few people. I did kind of an impromptu poll 
this is how I arrived at these things. And people comparing themselves to others was a very big issue. Um, I don't necessarily think it's very natural a lot of us do that, but I don't think that comparing yourself to others usually yields useful information. Because often, especially when you're a project lead, you're put under a tremendous amount of pressure to be a rock. You're the one who has to be the confident voice of sanity in a world gone mad. It's a lot like being a flight attendant. Like when I flew out here, I, got, I sprung for the extra legroom seat which has the added benefit of being right across from the jump seats where the flight crew sits when it gets bumpy. And so I, I'm kind of a nervous flyer, so whenever you hit turbulence, I'm like, are you guys okay? Okay, I'm good. <laughs> and if they look at all nervous, like I'm scrambling for my flotation device because I, you know, they would know when it's time to panic. So that's the position a lot of people in. I certainly know people who look very calm, and I know personally that they're really freaked out. So never assume that someone who appears calm actually is. But there's also another reason why someone might appear calm in the face of chaos. And it could be because they're suffering from a cognitive bias known as Dunning-Kruger effect. I see some nods. Do you guys know Dunning-Kruger effect? If you do not know what this is, Google it tonight. Because you'll be like, wow, there's a name for that? This explains so many people I know. <laughs> and so uh, Dunning-Kruger effect was the result of a study done by uh, David Dunning and Justin Kruger. In the, they were in the psychology department of Cornell University. And in it, they found that often low ability individuals greatly overestimate their skills and abilities. Whereas paradoxically, often high ability individuals tend to underestimate their skills and abilities. So in extreme cases, that's actually where imposter syndrome comes from. Because you might actually be really good at your job, but you might think, oh, well, maybe I'm not. So I was trying to think the other day of a good example of what would really illustrate Dunning-Kruger effect. And then this guy comes on and says this <laughs> in relation to the Puerto Rico fiasco. Let that wash over you. I don't have a schedule, but if I did have a schedule, I would say we're substantially ahead of schedule. <laughs> what the crap does that even mean? But he said it with such confidence. And if you were just listening to the way he said it, you go, wow, this guy is on it. But if you listen to the actual words, you're like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. Well, you know, you don't have to listen to his words to know he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> anyway, so I actually think that sometimes the fact that you might feel fear is actually indicative of something positive. So a couple of months ago, my team and I were in what was arguably the most important pitch of our company's existence. It was, it was with a client who unfortunately I can't talk about due to NDA reasons, but a lot of very fancy people on an extremely important IP. And it was one of those situations where we were like, how did we get here? We're all looking at each other like, wow, this is what weird things happened to land us here. And so it was a very <laughs> ambitious timetable and, and scope. So all these very fancy people are going around the table and telling us what we would need to do and the time we need to do it in. And at the end, um, this VP says, well, Amy, as the producer of Clutch Play, did you hear anything that scared you? And I look across the table at my two business partners and they're like, oh my god, don't screw it up. Don't say the wrong thing. Because, you know, of course, we really wanted this account. And in the end, I said the only thing I could say, which was the truth. And I'm like, well, yeah. I'm of course, I'm a little bit scared. This is a really ambitious project. It's a crazy timeline. However, here's the way I think we could approach it. Here are the risks we would have to mitigate. And here's how I would see us working together to make sure that this ran smoothly. And I got lots of head nodding and smiling. And afterward, one of their senior engineers sidled up to me and said, you know, it's really good that you just admitted that this is a scary project. Because if you had said, no, it'll be fine, we would have either assumed that you were too stupid <laughs> to be afraid, or that you were just really arrogant and we didn't really want to work with a, someone who was overly arrogant. So not always a terrible thing to feel fear. In fact, the primary purpose of fear is to keep us out of harm's way. So if you look at this from an evolutionary standpoint, the reason we're, why we're all sitting here is our caveman ancestors, when they saw a saber-toothed tiger, 
instead of running up and petting it going, you're fuzzy, they would run because petting it would result in death, right? So <laughs> the reason why we feel fear is to make sure we, we avoid things that are dangerous. And also, I find fear to be really instructive on these kinds of projects. Whenever something is really keeping me up at night, that's almost always a thing that ends up going sideways. So because I've spent so much time worrying about it, I have plans A, B, C, and D ready to go. When something happens, I can very decisively act on it because that's the thing I was worrying about and I was planning for that to go wrong. And uh, last but not least, uh, fear can be a really potent driver of success. So I find when we're working on our own projects, there are times where, you guys have probably been in a similar circumstance, where things don't seem to be moving as fast as they should be, and I find that often that's the result of uh, somebody being stuck in a perfectionism loop or a self-doubt loop. So they're like, ah, oh, this is not quite right, I don't know what to do with it, and um, they just kind of spin and spin and spin. And so when that happens, I find often injecting a potential point of failure is actually really useful. Um, so for example, I've, I've done things like if, if somebody is, is stagnating, signing us up to demo our game at a conference in like three weeks, like, hey, everybody, <laughs> you better get over it because we're going to look really stupid if we have nothing to show in three weeks. And suddenly everybody kind of snaps out of it. And they start focusing on what is the best thing I can do in this period of time versus what's the ideal thing to do. So one final thought about fear. When you're sitting in the pressure cooker, sometimes fear boils over and people freak out. And generally, when you are a producer, a project lead, or a DD, you are in the crosshairs of that freak out. It just kind of goes with the territory. So it's really important to remember that as stressed out as you might feel, other people on your team might be feeling it even more acutely. So uh, that is actually never more painful when the person who's freaking out is in a position of authority above you, whether it's a senior manager or a client, because that often manifests in some really unfortunate ways. Things like harsh criticism, micromanagement, questioning your abilities, that fun stuff. And unfortunately, that is exactly what you don't need, right? Because you're actually needing to focus all your efforts on getting things done and feeling confident about doing that. So I find when that does happen, the best thing to do is hit it head on and not suffer in silence. So especially when I worked for that company where I almost exclusively took on projects for clients who were gonna be fired if I couldn't deliver for them, these were very stressed out people with a lot at stake. And so, of course, they were freaked out. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Let, you know, maybe we should do it my way. And lots of very unproductive things. And generally, I found that when I was in that situation, the best thing to do was sit down with them, as scary as that can be, and say, listen, I know how stressed out you are. I get what's at stake. And I hope you can see that the, we as a team are doing everything we can to help you. But the way we're interacting, is not productive. So if there's something you need me to do differently, I'm happy to do it. But um, these kinds of interactions are adversarial and we need to be partners. And in every single case, that has gone down very well. And it's resulted in all of us walking away as, as better partners. And in fact, everybody I've ever had to have that conversation with, I'm really close friends with to this day. So scary as, as it is, I highly recommend it. So, we have covered a lot of ground on fear management. Let's move on to expectations. Because becoming really good at expectation management sort of directly correlates to becoming good at managing insane projects. So, today I want to talk about the three components of expectation management. And that is planning, scope, and schedule control, and communication. So let's start off by talking about planning first. And I'm guessing that pretty much everyone in this room knows more than the basics of project planning. So I want to focus on some of the weird nuances of planning that can cause things to go sideways later on. First is inadequate upfront communication. It's really easy to assume that everyone is on the same page 
especially when you're all sitting in the same meeting. So of course you're like, well, we, we all know the same information. How could we not be on the same page? And yet there's no way of knowing whether people are on the same page unless you explicitly have those conversations. And it's really important on these kinds of projects, any project really, that uh, everybody is bought into the goals of the project, that they understand the risks, that they know what their responsibilities are, and they've internalized the consequences for failure. And I don't know about you, I would much rather annoy my team and make absolutely sure they know exactly what's expected than get a really unhappy surprise down the line. So coming to the urge to act first and plan later. So this is actually a big one for larger game companies, especially when the heat is on. There's a lot of temptation to just grab your team and run in a direction as fast as possible because bigger companies want to see movement. Like, I don't understand why I'm not seeing progress. So it's tempting to just want to show them progress and start running. But you can't really be sure you're going to wind up where you want to go if you don't have a clear map of how you're going to get there. So it's really important that you start every project with a pretty clear understanding, shared understanding of what your responsibilities are. Because if you don't, um, it also opens you up to a lot of time wasty scope creep. And especially if you're a consultant, that can be really expensive. Over committing. In other words, failing to use the word no when appropriate. This is a really hard one for people who suffer from wanting to be a pleaser. And this is something that I actually really struggled with when I was younger. I, I always felt like I wanted to please. It was very hard to say no. But on these types of projects, especially where time is really tight, you have to focus on what's practical and not what's ideal. So that definitely means you've got to say no at times. Too much process. So I imagine that many people who are producers here are like, there's no such thing as too much process. Don't touch my process. The process is my moment of sanity in a world gone mad. It's how we make order out of chaos. And fair enough. But I also would say it's really important to recognize when process is there just to make us feel better as producers versus being a useful tool for the team. So in other words, it's really important to right size your process because I found that any any project I've ever worked on where there's a lot of heavy project management overhead, that's the first thing that gets cut when things get crazy. So a few years ago, I worked for a company where a new producer came in and said, I want to have better tracking of JIRAs. So no engineering task can be over six hours. And a lot of these engineers were working on huge systems that were potentially taking months. And so what would normally take maybe a couple days to estimate, it was taking us weeks. And needless to say, it was annoying all the engineers. It was a really inefficient use of time. And in the end, they cut it. But they also um, they wasted time, and they bugged people in the process. So I find I'd rather start a project with as little process as I can get away with. And then if the team lets me know that we need more, then we add more. Uh, failing to stay focused. This is another kind of tough one. Because on a lot of these projects, you end up having this fight between what's good for the big picture and the small picture. When you're trying to get something done in superhuman time, you cannot worry about the big picture. That is not something that is anything you can think about. So when you start finding you're having a lot of those big picture, small picture conversations, it's a really good opportunity to just sit everybody down and reset. If some of these big picture issues that people are concerned about are really important, then you actually have to find a way to, to open up your timeline. Otherwise, you need to let it go. And uh, last but not least, assuming that additional resources will solve all your problems. There is a great production saying. It's one of my two favorite production sayings next to it is what it is. And that is, you can't put nine women in a room and have a baby in a month. Have you guys heard that? <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorites. Mm. And when you're under the gun, it's really tempting to throw resources at the problem to try and fix it. And when you work for a larger game company, that's actually a thing you can do. Not so much when you're an indie, but larger game companies do tend to panic and say, throw resources on it. But that's not always the answer to everything. And in fact, so Clutch Play, when we did our first consulting gig, we had a really crazy timeline on that project. We had to get an MVP out 
pretty ambitious scope in 12 weeks, including a month of QA. So it was really tight. And we came in there with a very, very tight scope, and we felt really confident we could do it. And it was our team and a couple of people from the client side, and, um, and we just put our heads down and we did it. And we actually finished a day early. And so the clients were like, oh my God, we didn't even think you could do this at all, let alone finish a day early. This is fantastic. So imagine if you could do that much with a small group, imagine what you could do with twice that number of people. So the second phase, they just threw a bunch of people at us and it was just chaos because there were people of different skill levels. There, we had to ramp everybody on our process. It was harder to maintain code standards and just getting everybody ramped up while we were trying to actually hit our dates, it was, it was tough. And we did finish, but it was, it was definitely rocky. So I find when the schedule is really tight, I would much rather have a smaller group of very focused, skilled people than just the chaos of throwing people on and, and hoping it works out. So let's actually move on to scope and schedule control, which goes hand in hand with communication. By the way, do you guys know what CIA, CYA means? Is that a thing you say here? Cover, cover your ass? Oh, you, you say that? OK, good. Didn't know if that was a, an American thing. <laughs> so, um, so it's pretty important when you're on a rush project to hold yourselves to really high standards. That's what you have to do to get it done. So in order to do that, you have to establish some kind of framework that holds everybody accountable for their actions and decisions. And that includes you, your team, your clients, senior management, everybody. Everybody's pretty much got to walk the line. So a big part of that is actually through transparency. You can't really have accountability unless you have transparency. So it's really important to keep pretty detailed, consistent reporting, written and verbal all the time. And I know it sucks. Status reports suck. They're not fun. Stand-ups stand -ups suck less than status reports, certainly. Uh, but um, status reporting, I think, is really important. And if I'm going to cut corners somewhere, it's never going to be there because it is really important that everybody knows what's going on. Again, that's the CYA, covering your ass factor. And it's really important to keep a list of, you know, keep a running tab of what's going well, what's at risk, what's not going so well. And actually, when I was putting this talk together for GDC, my GDC advisor asked me, well, how do you actually get people to read status reports? And that's a really good question. So back in the day, I was on the Sims Online, the now defunct Sims MMO. And I was the community liaison to production. So basically, it was my job to funnel all the, the horror going on and the live game back to production. It was like exploits and bugs and terrible <laughs> people doing terrible things to each other so that, so that we could fix it as a team. And so I was often basically sharing a lot of really depressing information. And I found the only way I could really make that bitter pill go down was to stuff that status report with as much gallows humor as I possibly could. And I always knew when people were reading my status report, because I'd hit send, and within a few minutes, I'd hear lots of giggling and groaning in the team area. In fact, uh, somebody at one point came to me and said, you know, it'd be great if you'd make that less funny, because like the senior people at EA are now reading that report. So maybe, maybe tone it down a little, because <laughs> we don't want that kind of attention. So um, yeah, so there, there are ways you can get people to read status reports. But I would also say not all status reports have a huge audience. Like I have one client, I do a daily status report for him. He's an audience of one, he's the head of engineering. I do CC everybody on the team, but I know he's the only one who reads it because he tells me when he sees something he likes and he tells me when he sees something he doesn't like. So, but it is always good to make sure everybody knows what's up. Trade-off tracking. Oh, sorry, whoops. Um, so accounting for things that were not planned for. Doesn't matter how great a producer you are, things are gonna come up you didn't plan for. We all know that, it's just part of the territory. And um, when that happens, usually there's an if there's an obvious trade-off, it's, if it's important enough, then you, it usually is at the expense of something that you plan for. So it's really important to keep track of the things that you didn't plan for and so that you can account for those when you're making those kinds of trades. 
And when you do have to make trades, it is important to make sure those are noted at all times because I find, especially when you're working with clients, that when decisions are made in the heat of the moment, those are rarely remembered at the end of the project. So you get to the end often and they'll say, where was that feature that it's, I can see it right here in the initial scope? And you have to go, ha ha, see it right here. Remember on this date, we swapped it for this and, and we all agreed to that. So again, very important to do that to make sure that you're not stuck holding the bag on um, some, some scope creep that you're accountable for at the end of the project. Uh, running list of current action items. This is actually a big thing when you do weekly status reports. I actually find this is really useful for me because often if I have like a client call, um, I'll take down my list of action items and I'll say, oh wow, half of these are mine and I've only done a few of them. So it gives me a chance to run around and make sure that I'm consistent with what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but also I find this very useful when it comes to action items that are related to clients or senior managers. So for example, if you have an action item that's sitting on a senior manager, like let's say they owe you a decision or a document or you know, something that you need to keep your progress moving forward, and that action item sits open for a while, then uh, they're gonna be much more forgiving if they're the ones who are the bottleneck than if you're the one who's the bottleneck. So it's really important to keep that visible at all times. Out of scope requests. It happens every, every, every time. So whenever there is no obvious trade-off for an out-of-scope request, it's, um, it's really important to keep track of them. And again, when you have to keep scope tight, when you have to say no, um, often those things you can't accommodate. So at least you, ha you, you, you have to tell people you can't accommodate them. But there's usually always a little bit of wiggle room at the end of the project. So for us, whenever possible, we will try to accommodate out-of-scope requests when we can. And when we do, we keep a running list of all the extra things that we did that were outside of scope. And um, this can be very useful. So a few years ago, this is when I was outside of games. I had a client I really liked. The project was going pretty smoothly and she had a lot of out of scope requests. And so I pretty much accommodated all of them because she was great and we could. But right at the end of the project, she called me one day and she said, look, I've got these five other things I need to do and I just really need you to do them. And uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't accommodate. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, how do I very politely tell her that I'm just not gonna do this? And as I was thinking about how I was gonna do that, I let out this unconscious sigh. And, and all of a sudden she's like, oh, 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 I hear what you're saying. I totally, now you, got, you have given me a lot of stuff. I totally understand your point. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a $10,000 change order tomorrow and let, I really appreciate all the extra stuff you've done. I'm like, wow, this is the easiest conversation I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Wish all change order conversations were that easy. And it was easy because the list had the conversation for me. So some final thoughts on expectation setting. Again, never assume anyone knows what to do or is on the same page. Under promise, over deliver. Nothing should ever be a surprise and escalate. Escalate, escalate as much as you can. So a final thought about planning before you move on about crunch. So I mentioned at the beginning that we had this issue on Sims 2 where we had to get the animation pipeline caught up. And the way we actually did that, the way we went from being the most behind to the team who actually finished early was through kind of an interesting application of crunch. So this was a long time ago. This is back in the days. Do you remember EA Spouse? Does anybody remember that? Where people's lives were falling apart because of all the mandatory overtime at EA. So it was very common for people on those teams to be told, you have to work seven days a week. In fact, I as a producer had to work seven days a week for like two and a half years. So I don't recommend that. But uh, so this was actually before the team had gone into crunch. And my animation director and I sat down and we're like, hmm, everybody's tried all the sensible things. Let's look at this problem a little differently. So we came to the senior management and we said, okay, we've got a proposal. It's a little out there, but go with us. So in one month, we wanna take the team into crunch for just one month. And during that time, we're gonna schedule them for six days worth of work, which technically they can do in five because you never schedule someone for a full eight hours a day. Like you schedule someone for about six hours a day. 
So if they were really efficient with their time, maybe worked an hour or two over every day, they could get their work done in five days. But if they couldn't, they'd have to come in over the weekend. And the deal was, if we do this and they get caught up, when mandatory crunch time comes and everybody has to come in and work on the weekends, if these guys are caught up, they don't have to come in. They will be exempt from mandatory crunch. And so they were like, hmm, I don't like that idea. But eh, we'll say yes because we don't think you can do this. And so <laughs> it's pretty much that. So, um, so we went to the animators and we said, OK, in a month, you're going to crunch for a month. Here's the deal. And some very interesting things happened. For one thing, everybody really appreciated being given notice. Because especially for people with families, it's kind of a big deal when crunch just drops on your head. Because not everybody can kind of accommodate childcare, for example, at the drop of a hat. Or maybe you're taking a class that you can't suddenly stop going to class because you have to crunch for a month. So it's also the beginning of summer, and everybody got a chance to kind of get their yayas out and have fun for, for a month. And they knew it was coming. And they got a chance to be prepared for it. But when crunch actually came, some really interesting things happened. So for one thing, people became insanely efficient because nobody wanted to come in over a weekend. So they very quickly realized, if I can be hyper efficient with my time, no screwing around, if I can get my work done by like noon or maybe 2, 3 o'clock on Friday, I can start next week's work. So I'm guaranteed to not have to work this weekend and probably not going to have to work next weekend. So actually, people were getting really far ahead of where we expected them to be. And the, actually, there were a couple of people who did come in. Most, for the most part, people were not in on the weekends. But there were one or two people who always were in on the weekends. And those were the people who were horsing around all the time. <coughs> so that was also useful for me to know who actually was being inefficient with their time. And it was really interesting, because even after crunch ended and everybody was all caught up, that kind of eye towards efficiency, like everybody knew, like I don't ever want to be in a situation where I have to work on the weekends. So that kind of like let me manage my time well really continued on well after to the end of the project. So as I said, my team and I, we kind of live in a shit creek universe because we're often taking on really high risk, difficult projects. And when that happens, we, we don't actually crunch a lot, because I don't think we usually need to. We can usually find a way to not do that. But when we do use crunch, we tend to front load it just to get a little bit of velocity. We don't necessarily crunch towards the end, because I'd rather crunch a little bit early than be frantic at the end. So little thoughts on crunch. So let's move on and wrap up with chaos management. So much like fear, chaos is just kind of part of the equation. It's going to happen. No matter how good at your job you are, curveballs will come, shit will rain down. So it's important to have some coping mechanisms when that does happen. <laughs> Got to have a goofy cat. Um, so first and foremost, don't beat yourself up when things go wrong. They will go wrong. So it's really important to recognize that you don't have to be perfect. In fact, more often than not, the only people who ever expect us to be perfect are ourselves. So the only thing that you need to be is effective. That's all your team or clients or managers really want from you is to be effective. And I think one of the best ways to be effective is through constant evaluation and adjustment having that kind of process. So it's really important to watch your team, listen to your team, find out what's annoying them, what's frustrating them, what's getting in their way, and make those problems disappear. I'd have to say as a producer, I firmly believe that making problems go away is 95% of my job. Because I have a team of really talented people. They're great at solving technical problems. All other problems, they have no interest in. So it's kind of important to keep them focused on the things that they're good at. Um, so this is the answer to the riddle, how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? Often I found on kind of nutty projects, there's not one big thing that goes sideways that you can just focus all your attention on. There's like one little thing that starts a cascading sea of badness. And 
So suddenly things start going wrong in all these different places. And when that happens, it's really easy to panic and want to run at everything at once and try to plug all the holes as they're spouting badness your way. And that's never a good idea because then you have 20 things that are half done at any given point. So when that happens, it's really important to step back, take a deep breath, and make a list of everything that's going wrong, prioritize it, and just chip away at it one at a time. Stay clear about what is and is not in your control. There is a lot that's going to be outside of your control. The things you can deal with, deal with. Things you can delegate, delegate. Things that are outside of your control, let them go. Now, there are some things that seem like they're outside of your control, and they are to a degree. Like, for example, if you're a mobile developer, most of us know that if you don't get a feature from Apple, you're not going to make the revenue you hope to get. And that is 100% outside of your control. However, what isn't within your control is coming up with a plan of how you can get in front of Apple. So for example, you can go to WWDC and book an appointment with the App Store. I had no idea that that was a thing you can do, but that actually really helps. But I figured that out by kind of chipping away and going, how do I get in front of these people? Go to conferences where you know that they're walking the floor. Um, make your game attractive to them by putting in features and functionality that you know that they'll care about. That's within your control. So if you actually make a plan like that and you do everything you can to attract Apple's attention and you still don't get it, then at least you can say, I went down swinging. I did everything I could, and now I can be at peace with this. And uh, lean on your team as needed. Sometimes this is really hard because there are moments where you just feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you kind of feel like, oh, God, I'm wearing all this responsibility. It's all up to me. But I think that's one of the best parts of being part of a high-functioning team is that you don't have to do everything alone. Which brings me to my last point here. You are only ever going to be as good as the team around you. Unless you are a solo developer who you know, basically can program and market and animate and design and all that, you need to have a good relationship with your team, especially when the stakes are high and the pressure is, is really building. So it's really important that you maintain a, a trusting and respectful relationship whenever possible. So really that means that it's important to never ask anybody to do more than you're willing to do. And this seems kind of basic, but I'm surprised by how many times I've seen people not understand that. In fact, Often when I've had to step into a project that's in a bad way, it's because the person who had it before me basically <laughs> left early one too many times and the team, well, after asking the team to work later on weekends and the team went, you know what? You don't care, I don't care. I'm gonna let you fail. So if you're gonna ask people to work, you gotta be there in the trenches with them. So finding opportunities to lift up your team, this is another really important one. I was very lucky when I started out as a producer. I had a really great boss, and he really taught, I think, all of us what it meant to, to be part of a great team. And when, when I did something wrong, he took responsibility because he was the boss. And when I did something right, he shined the spotlight on me and my peers. Everyone on his team got promoted, so everybody wanted to be on his team. And he really always looked for opportunities to lift people up on the team. And that is a really important component. So if you have someone on your team who maybe wants to go in a different role, then find ways to give them some responsibilities that help them go into that role if possible. Or if your team is kind of small and you know, there aren't really a lot of set roles, Maybe if you're, if you're taking on consulting work and your team really likes working on certain kinds of projects, then look for those kinds of projects. There's always little ways you can find to reward the team and say thank you and lift people up, so it's really important to do that. And uh, last but not least, I'm just going to drop this right here because I think it really speaks for itself. <laughs> Be a champion and not an asshole. When you're working on a really difficult, high-stress project, being an asshole buys you absolutely nothing. And it's kind of surprising how many people don't seem to know that. But um, it's, it's a, a very critical part of success. So on that note, I'm like right bumping up against my time. It's like right at 50 minutes. 
So I was going to open it up to questions, but I don't actually know if I have time. <laughs> so I will actually be here afterward if anybody has any questions about their project, projects or, or just about being up Shit Creek. Yay, I made it. And my battery did not die, so hooray. <laughs>